Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to this important uh, session. Uh, before we start, there are a few um, house rules. We have bathrooms outside, um, and may I kindly ask you to put your phone on silent. Um, a lot of electronics around here. It is a feed in. Uh, if you could uh, put your cell phones on silent, I uh, would highly appreciate that. <coughs> I'd like to invite uh, my brother, um, Mr. Naidu, to come and give an introduction to the STEAM um, panelists we have. Um, and then we 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 carry on <coughs> with the session today. I uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. David Monyai. <coughs> Prof. David Monyai is our facilitator. My name is Edwin Naidu, and we're here to talk about human rights in Africa. Firstly, we'd like to convey, on behalf of the Deputy Minister of International Affairs and Cooperation. Minister Alvin Bortis, an apology. He was supposed to <coughs> join us, but had to be summoned to move elsewhere. And there is a possibility he may join us through a video link later. We're hoping that may happen. But we're also getting Deputy Minister Obed Bartella on his way to, from the airport to join us later. So we're hoping that he drives safely and makes it on time. He was appointed as Deputy Minister of Public Enterprises on the 6th of March. So we're looking forward to him coming and talking to us. Uh, he was previously Deputy Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, responsible for traditional affairs from 20th of May 2019 to 6 March 2013. So, <coughs> so our speakers include Amina Gurib Fakim, she's a biodiversity scientist and the former president of Mauritius in 2015. Born in Suriname, Mauritius in 1959, Ms. Gurib Fakim finished a high school education at a convent school in Patribons before studying chemistry at the University of Surrey. She completed a PhD in organic chemistry at Exeter University before returning to Mauritius in 1987. She's taken part on a number of platforms in South Africa uh, on gender, on science. Sorry. Okay. So um, Ms. Oh, she's one of our speakers. And then we've also got on the panel <coughs> Sifiso Mashlangu, who's the editor of the Star newspaper. Sifiso has been a political journalist for about 15 years and has Acquit, acquitted himself with distinction throughout his career and we're very happy that he's you know used his skills in a variety of ways he worked uh, as an advisor for the government of in, in Botswana and as a correspondent for BRICS news as well so he also worked as content creator for African politics on Al Jazeera so thank you for joining us at Piso. Uh, Hello. We've also got Magdalene Munsami who's joining us. <laughs> All the way from Pretoria. <laughs> so Magdalene has been actively involved in politics for many years and she's now a proprietor of Magdalene Munsami Attorneys and the founder of the Women's Justice uh, Foundation. She continues to contribute to the local continental and international entre entrepreneurial, legal, environmental, and social development. She's a public speaker and thrives on justice. We'll give her a chance to get her breath back before we, Prof Munia, you know, discusses. And we've also got on the panel Amir Sheikh, who's been in, our con in the country 15 years, is an entrepreneur, but also very invested in cham championing the rights of migrants. Thank you for that. And. Uh, He's the chairperson of the African Diaspora Forum, and we, my brief intro, introduction, I think hopefully it was meant to be brief so that you know who the panel members are, and I hand over to Prof. Monyai who will facilitate the discussion. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, thank you very much. 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, and all those who are online, uh, once again, welcome uh, to this session. We're looking forward to um, an exciting discussions um, in which we discuss mainly the state of human rights on our continent. We talk about human rights, um, those of us in universities, it's much more theoretical. But if we look at the state of human rights in Africa, we have to reach a point where we take stock um, and to have these cross-cutting conversations, those in practice and lawyers that we have on the panel, um, scholars, activists, civil society, and those in government and former leaders, all of, all of us discussing with the main aim of finding solution to worsening human rights abuses on our continent. And the moment you mention the notion of human rights, it really depends firstly who you are, where you stand, your ideological outlook. Um, the concept itself of human rights tend to be much more uh, popularized uh, in the Western world, where it's so limited. Uh, it's limited to issues of elections, um, good governance, but it's mainly pro-business, uh, opening up uh, of society, free movement of people, uh, activities of big companies, and that's the trend we've been having um, in our lifetime. We tend to look at this minimalist way of human rights. But what we wish to do uh, in this session, and thanks to higher education uh, media, uh, as well as the ADF, um, African Diaspora Forum, uh, who are heading this session. We really want to go much more deeper that when we talk about human rights, we're talking the rights that are enshrined in our constitutions, the rights that are enshrined in the AU, the rights that are enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as far back as 1948. We need to go much more deeper and ask that <coughs> what we are talking about, it goes beyond the ballot box. Because the moment you talk about human rights, uh, the very first thing uh, are politicians who want to get into power and their right to get into state house and the freedom to govern. We really want to talk in terms of those rights are important that we have the right to vote, we have the right of movement, but fundamentally we also have to have the right of the belly to have something to eat, to move in a road that has bridges, no potholes, um, <coughs> right to education, a right to 24 7 uh, power. It has become a huge crisis, particularly in Southern Africa, where load shedding become a norm. Um, we reach a point where people are shocked when they have 24 hours electricity. It's becoming abnormal to have 24 hour electricity. And we need to normalize that the right to education, the right to eat, the right to move, right to employment, the right of environment that you need to breathe fresh air that is not poison. These rights are all important. And this is a critical year for us as Africans. Our continent, the AU, will reach its 60th birthday this year. From the 25th of May 1963 to the 25th of May 2023. This is six years and we need to celebrate and there can never be a better way of celebrating the AU 
without asking fundamental question, regardless of which unit these territories that we have um, out of 55 African countries. We're speaking as Africans, we're not zooming to any specific unit um, and the preoccupation we have as Africans. That in 1963, our leaders, our people, dreamt of an Africa that is fully integrated, an Africa whose people are free to move anywhere, any part of the continent. We had um, a dream of self-determination of all Africans. This includes Western Sahara. We had a dream that our people will have the right to participate at the world stage as equal to others. And therefore, I would like to welcome the panelists to discuss this important and take stock where we are <coughs> and ask this hard question. And we're going to open for those who are online and in the audience right here, where you will ask questions, you will add your own views. But I would like to appeal to all of you that we are here as brothers and sisters, comrades, friends. Um, and we'll all do that in an orderly way. There will be disagreements, but we need to find a way of having this important conversation. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome, I think I'm starting with the former um, head of state of Mauritius. Um, your Excellence, I can't see you, and I apologize, I'm giving you back, given our sitting arrangement. Um, I'll give you time to um, lead us uh, in these important uh, discussions. I hand uh, over to you, uh, Excellency. Uh, good afternoon to all the audience present. Good afternoon to Mr. Moderator. And I'd like to thank Edwin Naidu for associating me with this very important debate. Uh, Mr. Moderator, you have mentioned a few words, very important words in your introduction. And I must confess here, I haven't come prepared with it, with this speech, but I'll just share a few words of, of wisdom that come straight from the heart as to what I think on the state of uh, the human rights situation in Africa. Of course, as you have rightly said, our African continent is 55 countries, highly diverse in terms of uh, uh, people, in terms of uh, culture, uh, religious practices, you name it, we have, we have all the diversity here. Uh, where do we see ourselves uh, now in this 21st century? And where we came from, I think I'll go back, if I may, to the time of 1895, when 1895, yes, during the, uh, the, the Berlin conference, when the scramble of Africa started, I think this is where we saw the, the, the land drawn in the sand, uh, separating our people and uh, creating these artificial borders. Unfortunately, they're still here to stay, I think, until further notice. And we saw how the identity of Africa was being shaped after, after that, that, that conference. But has it really happened? And uh, what is the state of affairs uh, as we speak? There's something I'd like to juxtapose here. Uh, after the Berlin Conference, let's go back because you, you mentioned uh, the Western world. The Western world, uh, we saw that human rights was enshrined in uh, the constitutional countries through various stages in the in the evolution of uh, of the Western world. But here, I'd like to present what happened after the Enlightenment period, when the whole issue of human rights, where the whole issue of institution, the way we reason things, the age of reason has been called, started after the independent of the scientific revolution and restore of course the emergence of uh, the Enlightenment. 
and how this period has really shaped Europe for what we know today. And where do we see ourselves within that framework? We saw, we saw the, the, uh, the post-independent history of our continent, about 60 years post-independent history. And I feel, unfortunately, I may not, of course many people may not agree with me, but I think we have made tremendous progress within these 60 years, at least in institution building. I'll just take one, uh, one institution. Uh, we're speaking about uh, the political world. We saw that uh, uh, 60 years ago when uh, African countries were becoming independent, we saw uh, many, for example, army leaders at the helm of our country. Now we're seeing a migration towards more te technocrats, towards more scientists, and uh, people from civil society taking uh, their positions at the helm of their countries. And I, I see this as progress. I see also uh, the position of women. Some people, again, will see the glass always half, half empty, but I still look at it as half full. We've had six women head of state on this continent, two sitting women head of state as we see it now. Now, if I put this in the backdrop of my own country, uh, since independence 1968, we have seen an increased feminization of many important institutions in my country, the judiciary, academia, you name it, although politically we are still uh, far from the accepted quota of 30%, but still, I think it's work in progress. So we're seeing progress there. We're seeing our rights uh, for us here, at least in Mauritius, to be respected in terms of access to education, access to healthcare, access to many other services, which unfortunately may not be present in, African, in many other countries on the African continent but here in my, at, at the level of my country we are seeing access to all of these services but there is a but and I think I would like to caveat this here because whenever we speak about human rights we always equate it to ballot box to voting and I think this is where we're wrong and I think you rightly mentioned this in your discussion uh, Mr. Chair is that, that Human rights should not be equated only to access to the ballot box voting because it can become an empty show because under the, the, the guise of having access to the ballot box, we find that the rights to education, the rights to well, civil rights uh, as we know it, they are, being, they are being removed or at least they are eroding away. And I think this is where I think civil society and our institutions must be very mindful in looking at, when we look at a society, when we look at indicators, and we are all driven by indicators nowadays, uh, we must do, dig deeper and look at what is the real situation in the country. And this is where I think we can drive our discussion today, look at the indicators and look at where we, where we started and where we are. As I said, we started 60 years ago, we are, we are moving, work in progress, and we are taking notice of the fact that Africa sh Africans should have right to food, should have right to, free, to fresh air, clean air, should have the right to water, and all these issues which make our society whole. And I think this is where we really need to take stock and analyze the state of evolution of our continent through all these basic, basic rights which were added together, will, will create the whole that, that we are after. Now, there is something else that uh, I, I put at the beginning. We looked at the state of institution. I said that in the West, we've had the age of the, the age of reason. We've had the, the time uh, when they started looking, reasoning, building our institution. The next thing that we have to look at on our continent is how we are building our institutions. Because at the end of the day, politicians come and go, it should stay. An institution must be that rock on which we will build our, our countries, our, our world, build the rights of the people through our institution. This is where I think we need to start really looking at where we are in Africa. So building an institution, address, looking at the indicators, looking at all these basic entities that will make, what well, we can say, we can safely say that 
yes, Africa is on the way to progress. Africa is respecting the human rights. But there's something I would like to put on the table here, and I think we all have to look at it, is the case of refugees. And here we have all sorts of refugees. We have migrants, we have climate refugees, we have economic migrants, we have all these which are, which are all being classed under the term of refugees. Now, if we look at climate refugees, I think this is where we have to be very, very firm vis-a-vis -vis the international community. Migrant uh, uh, climate refugees is the issue which should go beyond the frontiers of our continent because our continent has not contributed to greenhouse gas emissions and yet we are seeing that these countries are bearing the brunt. <laughs> And this is where we have to demand our rights vis-à-vis -vis the international community. And we have seen the recent flooding in Malawi, we have seen the flooding in Mozambique, we are seeing all these issues. And the other point that we have to be mindful of, and this is, comes again to our institution, to our own, is how to tackle corruption. Because corrupt actions make the country poorer. And this is something that has to be, not just on the back burner, but has to be addressed in our everyday life. We need to tackle corruption at its very core. And it all starts with every one of us. How are we going to put that on the table? How do we tackle our own dailies and see to it that we actually get rid of corruption? Because every corrupt act will make the country weaker, will make the country poor. And you mentioned something today about, uh, in fact, I'm seeing that every day in the newspaper in South Africa, the load shedding. How did South Africa get there? I mean, this is something beyond belief. Africa, South Africa is one of the biggest economies, and we all looked up to South Africa as, uh, you know, because, you know, throughout our history in Mauritius, we always looked up to South Africa as a big brother next door. And we want to see South Africa getting back on the rails, addressing these rights, as we have said, water, food, energy, clean air, you name it, and we want to see South Africa become that beacon of leadership on the continent because the continent will be a lot weaker without the positive input that this country can bring to the table. So please, let us get this right. Let us address corruption. Let us make sure that our brothers and sisters can live together in peace, in harmony, in equity, and address also this issue of inequality, because if you talk about human rights, we're also talking about inequality. So I think this is what I would like to add to the conversation. And uh, unfortunately, I will not be able to stay much longer, but if there are any questions straight away, I can take them, or else I will wish you a great conference addressing these very critical issues that plague our continent. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellence, for wonderful uh, input. Uh, Deputy Minister, um, you have already been introduced, um, but for those, um, we have uh, Deputy Minister of Enterprise. Um, I always say comrades, so. <laughs> 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 oh, bit, so it is a pleasure having you. Um, we would like invite you. Uh, you can, as a matter of fact, whether you speak from there, you prefer coming here, I'll come down yeah, and brief from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. And uh, may okay. I, uh, the His Excellency, I think she is uh, rushing somewhere else. Okay. We are releasing her. Yes, thank you. Um, okay. We would uh, like to thank you, Your Excellence. Uh, we don't see you on the screen, but uh, we'll also take this opportunity to thank you uh, for being with us. Thank we you. know how busy your schedule is. Uh, we thank you and looking forward to engage you on other issues related to this thematic area. We thank you. All the best. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to come to the um, t main table here and introduce my brother. Um, but let me also acknowledge the presence of Ambassador, uh, His Excellency Bassett from West Sahara. A pleasure to see you, Ambassador.
complete you, uh, brother. We have, we, we know each other quite well for years. Um, let me introduce uh, yet um, a well-known um, editor uh, of the Star newspaper. Uh, this last time I introduced you, you were at the start. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my brother, Sviso uh, Masangu, uh, uh, to give his contribution, and then after his input, uh, Deputy uh, Minister uh, Obet will uh, uh, come. We're just giving you time. I called okay. him as first speak. But we have protocol. We, we have protocol that we are trying to <laughs> balance. <laughs> but anyway, we will uh, go with the flow as you uh, indicated. Thank you. There you are, my brother. Thank you very much. It can never be said that uh, I never spoke before a government <laughs> minister. <laughs> uh, Good. Minister Babela, um, be greeted, uh, honourable uh, uh, panel members, uh, Dr. Munyai, and uh, the audience, and of course our our digital audience, uh, fellow panel member Ms. Uh, Magdalene Monsami, the first Treasurer General of the EFF and the attorney of Miss Kelly Kumalo. It is of course uh, uh, part of our job in the press to introduce people correctly. <laughs> I think today's discussion is important not right now because of the dispensation we we find ourselves in but never has it been more critical for for africans to talk to each other about africa or to have a conversation about themselves to each other if a frank and nuanced conversation about the state we find ourselves in and the very causes uh, that that brought us to this point. To have a foreign head of state, a former head of state, tell us that we looked up to South Africa, but we read about the load shedding and its impact on South Africa and the continent, leaves us, I think, comrades at a place where we should find ourselves embarrassed uh, for where we find ourselves in. I want to provide some statistics for you um, before I make my point. Uh, 71 people are killed in South Africa every day. 71 people are killed in this country every day. We are almost at the half mark of, of unemployment and in particular unemployment. We are facing drastic numbers in, in the line of poverty, unemployment and inequality, it doesn't seem like we'll be able to solve the, the housing challenge. Uh, in Gauteng alone, we are 800,000 houses behind, and that's just for, for RTP housing. The jobs we talk about are middle entry jobs, um, a, lo a large part of our, our jobs that are counted in the number of unemployment is jobs by waiters and um, underskilled workers, entry-level workers or people earning the, the minimum wage. It is therefore time for South Africa to talk to itself, uh, not just to listen to what government and the propaganda of, of what government is saying. But this opens a larger conversation about where Africa is and where we intend to go. So we must admit that nothing is going to work for us without us. But we're going to have to decide if we're going to resolve a lot of the conflict in Africa on how as writers we cover NATO, how we speak about NATO, and why we ask the questions why are they allowed to do what they do? 
and maybe it's time I think colleagues that we stop this this kid gloves approach to to the West because obviously it's a very serious matter when Russia goes to war with its enemy or its neighbor Ukraine and all of a sudden the Secretary of State of the US runs to South Africa so Russia has a war with its neighbor but the Secretary of State runs to South Africa to talk about Russia and Ukraine, something that he ought to think has got nothing to do with us. It doesn't happen in the continent that another country, a foreign country, runs to resolve the conflict between Palestine and Israel. They don't run to resolve the conflict in, in the Western Sahara region and in, and in Morocco. But when it's about NATO, South Africa is expected to take a position because it has infringement on the West. So if the West is really that powerful, we must then consider where else are all their powers aided? Where is Kagame getting all this power? Who's behind him? In Tanzania, when the former president died, suddenly the UK had an interest and was advising government on COVID relief programs they needed to take. And whilst all of us are going to be discussing today we have a problem with guns in Mozambique. The Mozambicans are not funding themselves to have guns. The Mozambicans don't have bread and water. Where do they get the AK-47s? Where do they get the bullets? They don't have water and they don't have a can of beans right now. So who's funding these weapons? So who's funding not just the, the wars, the poverty battles happening in, in Zimbabwe? But who are the beneficiaries to keep Zimbabwe where it is today? The beneficiaries, of course, are not in Africa. They are somewhere in the West. They are enjoying what is happening here. They are enjoying the, the, the melodramas of Ntlantla Lux, uh, his Adventism against a people of his own color. They are enjoying the, the battles and the wars that go on here. The, the lack of border control, the porous borders that we find. Who's supporting all the guns? Perhaps our answer is with human trafficking rising in Joburg, where are the people trafficked to? Where are they going? Who are the beneficiaries of this thing? When you look at mining in the mining industry and you talk about uh, high economics, and the state of which, the state at which we find ourselves. Who are the beneficiaries of all this gold that, that's, uh, that's being exploited, all these minerals that are running? And maybe the, 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 the questions, Dr. Munya, is in the answer. And maybe my answer is in the questions. The beneficiaries of Africa's poverty are the people who benefit from it. The same ones who keep selling us arms, the same ones who fund the, the turmoil in the West African region, the same ones who bring the guns to, to, to Mali, to Niger, uh, to Benin, and ultimately it is the West. What is that West's interest? It is for an unstable Africa, an unstable continent, which cannot afford bread. Because when you can't afford bread, then we keep raising our hands to the West and they keep supporting. You know, they give you a little bread and you revolt against your brother. And today I'm hoping for a very liberal and direct conversation about the state we find ourselves in because a lot of Africa's problems are not designed by, by Africans. So we want a capitalist society Every, our movies are of the West, our music is of the West, our products is of the West, our identity is of the West. We're not going to get Zimbabwe out of trouble until we become realistic about the reason Zimbabwe is in this situation. It is the sanctions imposed by the US, supported by George Biden and his government in order to exploit Zimbabwe and the minerals. 
and we can write and say all we want about how Zimbabwe is going to go, you know, to be free and how ZANU PF is going to, to be to be liberated and we need a new president. There's no president who's going to come to Zimbabwe that's going to change Zimbabwe unless we talk about the real problem. It is designed in the West. No matter who becomes the president of South Africa, it's not going to to satisfy our employment issues and our housing issues because our, our constitution is fundamentally flawed, because of our intrinsic connections to the West, because we continue to, to ask for funding from the Bretton Wood institutions, the IMF and the World Bank. They continue to get us into more debt every year to borrow, and they call us friends uh, whilst we are prisoners to them. We're never going to be free. We can't discuss solutions about Mozambique without putting the US and the UK at the heart of the problem. So I think Africa, our solution is in the mechanisms of truth. The truth we are allergic to speaking. Our problem is the, the, the foreign. Our problem is our former handlers and monopoly capitalism. Our problem is the very West that we're afraid to, to rock the boat about. So easily we can say it's the FF that's the problem. In the 80s it was Azapo that's the problem. In the 90s it was the PAC that's the problem. In the early 2000s it was the DA that's the problem. Right now it's the ANC that's the problem. Uh, when Action SA or whoever takes over it will be that that is the problem but we were allergic to identifying the real orchestrator, the real architect of Africa's poverty, the real, Af the real architect of, of Africa's discussion. And it is the boardrooms and design of the free world, that being the UK and the US. And I think this conversation opens us to, to discuss all of those. But post that discussion is how we walk from this room from this cinema to create a difference in our very audiences, in our very meetings and very communities. Uh, thank you, moderator. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, as you were speaking, I was taking notes. Uh, you mentioned 71 people um, murdered on a daily basis. Um, unemployment, poverty, inequality, the housing shortage, uh, each question of jobs that you have looked at, and the current affairs pertaining to the conflict um, in Ukraine, NATO, Russia, and the impact that it is having on our continent, in which were forced to take sides. Um, you touched on the Great Lake region, um, particularly the role played by Uga um, Rwanda. And would like to carry this uh, conversation. Um, and I think our main aim is to look at the question of good governance. We can say as much as we want um, about all these problems. I think the fundamental question is, how should we be governed? What does it mean when we talk about good governance? We need to take charge of our own affairs. We have these rights. And we need to exercise these rights in a very careful way. Uh, these governments are not foreign governments. These are our governments. And we need to fully understand when we elect leaders, it does not mean it ends there, putting people in state houses. It's becoming very fashionable these days. Um, we need to go beyond your minimalist government looking at politicians. We also need to look at um, challenges that we face uh, and look deeper 
but we have a powerful country such as Nigeria, um, unable to take charge of what's happening in its own territory in terms of security, not of its own making, um, and there's a history. The fall of Libya in 2011, massive dumping of weapons on our continent. The entire Sahel region, climate change, and these guns are going everywhere. They are flowing into Central, Eastern, up to Southern Africa. As Fiso mentioned, Mozambique. Um, even, even in our own uh, country, we've, we face a lot of illegal guns. I think we need to ask these questions. How do we arrest these <coughs> challenges we have? What is our duty? How can we be responsible to arrest these challenges? We need to arrest unemployment, hunger, our people are sleeping without those who are sleeping across the continent. Yet, this is a continent with the 60 most fertile land in the world, capable of feeding the entire world. But we are considered as people who require assistance, handovers. We need to ask these questions. The capital flows that the bulk of resources that are coming in the name of aid, there's more money leaving the continent than money that is being given to the continent. And therefore we go back to the aspirations of our leaders in 1960 with the formation of the OAU. We moved right straight to 2022 in Durban, transformation of the OAU to AU. We have developed African institutions that deals with issues of judiciary, that deals with issues of development, NEPAD, and self-assessment. We have the APRM with us and their reports on each and every country. I think these are basic questions we're asking. What's happening? How do we tighten this? Uh, questions. What is the role and what is our role at the UN level? Do we speak with one voice as Africans or not? On these very same issues, including the, the division on the UN General Assembly when the vote were taken. Shocking. As we are concerned, with the continent dividing, I mean, geographically, I think you all have followed and the predictions that are going to come, that the continent is going to split into two physically. And there's going to be an ocean in between, into two parts. You can see the crack that we face. But politically, we also see these divisions among ourselves as Africans. So when we talk about human rights, we need to look deeper externally, we also have to look deeper internally and see to it what is it in the governance of our countries that forces people not to stay in their places, in their, in their of birth. Yes, we have a right to move to any part of the continent, but there are these push and pull factors. How do we ensure that the crisis in Eritrea, in Zimbabwe, in Swaziland, in Swatin, and other parts, hotspots of the continent in Central Africa are arrested um, in a way that brings stability to our continent. So these are some of the uh, issues that we uh, confront and will proceed. I would like to invite um, Advocate um, to um, take your time to give us your input on these burning issues. I thank you. Yeah, well, I could.
Uh, I don't know whether to start with Sfiso or to start with the topic. <laughs> but let me start by um, uh, the Honorable Deputy Minister, uh, Comrade Bapela, thank you for uh, sitting on my left, because the left is always my strongest side. <laughs> and also let me thank uh, Sfiso and uh, Amir as well as uh, the uh, Prof. Um, I want to go back to uh, 1920. Um, <coughs> you know, I carry big books because it's a form <laughs> of... Uh, people don't use it to read. It's an instrument of, uh, of self-defense. Okay. Intimidation. Yeah, so, huh? It's just self-defense, yeah, it's just for self-defense. Well <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, because uh, I'm sitting at a table with a lot of men, and we're talking about feminization, uh, uh, femicide and GBV, so I must protect myself uh, in some way or another. Um, let me start with 1920 uh, and bring us to where we need to be. 1920, the report on the work of the Council of the People's uh, Commissars, uh, this report produced by Vladimir Lenin on the 22nd of December 1920. And what Lenin says is that we peasants, uh, this is after the electrification program plan that was rolled out uh, throughout all over the country, uh, which was a desire. Uh, but it was unknown because, uh, and you know from what uh, was said, with we peasants who were unenlightened and I think if you understand the state of peasantry and enlightenment in its double, in its double form, it makes you realize the power then of not just empowering your people economically, but also empowering them with the ability to empower themselves economically. Um, and now light has appeared amongst us, an unnatural light uh, lightens the peasant's darkness. So it's unnatural light, but it is, uh, uh, it, it's still lightening the darkness of poverty if it, if it is there. Um, so I think I want us to start there because th that gives us an idea of the fact that we are not imagining the situation in the country, in the world, and where um, the now Vladimir Putin is uh, in terms of looking at the situation of fuel and the crisis that such has cost to the economy of the globe. And when we're speaking about the state of human rights in Africa, I want us to be very considered of the fact that the state of human rights of, uh, in, uh, in Africa is an economic factor. You know, when you want to speak about human rights, you must ask yourself, is freedom going to? It's a question that we know very well. Comrade Bapela, can you eat freedom for breakfast, lunch, and supper? So I think one of the things that showed us that really, indeed, there are people out there who are trying to make the effort to bring about and turn around the intention of what we be perceived to be good governance Africa. I heard there was a march on the 20th of March. Is that right? In Kenya. Did you hear about it? The same day. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the one in Kenya. Shut down also, yeah, uh, same I heard about it. I didn't see the pictures of the masses that were promised to be delivered uh, on the ground in Kenya. I don't know if anybody's following me, but I'm, I'm yeah, feeling yeah. I'm feeling <laughs> bored. I just saw a few so, people okay, there yeah. scattered, but so, yeah. <laughs> we don't have a problem because Kenya itself is a problem when it comes to foreign policy issues in Africa. But what we want to say is the following. When you take people to the streets who are hungry and want to fight for things that is not the urgent necessity, apart from electricity indeed, they let us find a way to sit at the table and fix it. Because what we find in many of our environments is that the electrification problem is not just a problem of what may lay with public enterprises, but a bigger systemic problem that exists, which we must know the truth from about. So when that truth comes out, and when the state is ready to deliver its truth to the people, 
then maybe we won't be so angry with them when we don't have the ability to send out a, a, a pleadings a comment by Pella. And so I want us to then go to the fact that, uh, of what I really wanted to start with. Um, and that is the issue of, you know, the human rights and human wrongs. I think it was uh, the former president, Thabo Mbeki, I'm not sure who was it that spoke about the human wrongs. I don't want us to overthink. You know, when we speak about the age of reasoning and the age of enlightenment, we are philosophizing, um, we are philosophizing, uh, uh, I had a note here, I just don't want to miss my point. It's a, philo it's, a, it's a philosophy, we are philosophizing in the pedantic of what the United uh, uh, Nations Declaration on Human Rights was meant to be, what the African Union Constitutive Act was meant to be, what the African Commission uh, 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 on, human, on Human Rights and Peace was meant to be. It's a philosophy. That is what it is. The reality is understanding what is wrong with the inaction of the of human rights because human rights really it's just a it's it's a muzzle tool of colonial character to counteract its ability to be taken to task for its wrongness. That's just exactly what it is. And I think when we understand and go into the uh, history of what then happened in uh, African history collectively. Uh, we, we appreciate that. You know, we look at the situation in the South Sudan. There's peace today, there's war tomorrow. The husband and the wife get kicked out of the cabinet. There's absolutely no governance. There's no accountability. And this is the way we don't, we did not want, I think, even for ourselves to have the, handle the cabinet reshuffle because speculation was rife. You know, there was a picture that went around. If any of you did not receive it in this room, you are lying to yourselves. The, the cabinet and then it was just the cabinet, the picture of a cabinet there, okay? And really, what we saw and what we understand was a responsible, a responsible situation of leading a country which, by the way, the ANC leadership is not unaware, has trouble. None of us sitting in this room are ostriches with our heads under the, the soil. We understand very well what it is at. But we face with the situation, what is the state of human rights in Africa? And I want to say that when the former president, Her Excellency, speaks, I wanted to ask a question, but then, uh, Dr. Prof, I'm going to blame it on you. You cut her off because you didn't want the engagement or something. Or <laughs> I'm joking. You know, this thing of saying we are getting there with women empowerment is absolute nonsense. Rwanda has 61% parliamentarians, absolutely ineffective. Ineffective. Because we want to see that 45% the percent that we have committed, Obed, Obed Bapela, to see not only them, but the remaining of the 50, my maths are bad. What is it? You know what it, what it is. The remaining percentage must be accountable and it's not uh, a Swiss of 71 people who are dying every day. It's 82 people who are dying every day in this country. 82. 135 women are raped a day in South Africa. And yet we want to speak as a continent about the state of human rights. And boast numbers when we cannot see the qualitative impact on the ground. Um, uh, and so and this is the same situation, we understand the situation in the Gambia, and one of the things I think that's very important is to address the state of human rights in Africa, because I believe, and I'm going, this is my conspiracy theory, so nobody must take me seriously from this point onwards. <laughs> because I can see this room is outnumbered. Human rights is a conspiracy of patriarch, uh, patriarchy. <laughs> But if you think about it, and you deconstruct the colonial mindset, Africa has never been a patriarchal society. We know this. I'm going to come to attend to you in the Western Sahara Sufiso just now. But I want you to understand the issue of what is a system of patriarchy's contribution towards a human rights violation in this country. Are we conceptualizing it, and are we 
placing it into context as much as it needs to be. Because this belly that you're talking about, Prof, the belly rights of potholes and the rights of uh, the belly rights, is that not also, apart from being patronage, is it not also equally the right of male first to the the honey pot, mm -hmm. or is it because when we speak about Africa and we speak about FTIs, international trade, where are women at the forefront of leading in those institutions? You'll find them at the forefront of the uh, Human Rights Watch, for example, where it's just their hearts are soft mm -hmm. and then they can cry and they can do all of these things. These are realities. We have a refugee crisis in this continent. We have a situation in this country, whether you like it or not, FISO, where there are undocumented people who are committing crimes and compromising the sovereignty and the territory of our borders. There must be consequences. Can't have people running around committing crimes. And that human trafficking that you're speaking about is not only unique to Johannesburg. I was almost human trafficked the other day, I'm joking, I was... <laughs> 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 but really, when we start looking at the predisposition of monetary and fiscal policy, understanding micro and macroeconomics, looking at to the extent to which the aspect of human rights has not been able to find that, uh, if, if I can call it a pendulum, bringing together a microeconomic environment a macroeconomic environment with one where, if you remember, uh, there was a report 2005, Comet Owen Papera from the presidency, which spoke about the growth of the informal sector. But yet we focus on the competition element. We don't focus on the competition <coughs> element, sorry. But we don't integrate the man on the street into the macroeconomic system. And that's where it's just, it's, it's just a, look, it sounds very simple, but think about it. Would you see a uh, outside, uh, 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 what is this, uh, fancy building? Give me a name of the fancy building. Um, the House of Sfiso, no. right? No. You were not going to, <laughs> you're not going to find anyone running an informal business outside Sfiso's house. So my thing is that, so I'm just teasing at you. For me, I think the violation of human rights uh, uh, in, 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 Afri in the African continent is a colonial construct and that remains something that must be resolved. And I want to take this one step further. Um, apart from market volatility that can be resolved, it, we don't need to have a volatile market. We are the bread basket. We are not the one who is uh, begging bread? When did we become the beggars of bread? What's happening in Morocco and the Western Sahara right now? It's fisheries, it's phosphates, it's natural resources. That's a desert. <coughs> you will, you'll explain the uh, environment. I'm just giving you a task. <laughs> <laughs> it is, a, but why are people fighting? Look, I brought this book for one reason, guys. I did not read it. I only read this page. You can see. This is my bookmark. Let's go. It's a Declaration and Resolutions of the First Conference of Independent African States in Accra, 1958. And the resolution, too, speaks to the future of dependent territories in Africa. And I ask myself, what were the crafters of this declaration thinking? The same Nkrumahs that we love, and uh, today I'm angry with him, only now. <laughs> okay, I just want to place a disclaimer. What were they thinking? Because what they were saying was, we must have a date when this dependent theory, a, a territory becomes independent. Now I'm saying, we have a last colony on the continent. That colony remains unresolved. It remains uh, occupied. It remains brutalized. There are refugees, there are prisoners of war, there are political prisoners, there are people without legal representation held for no reason, shape or form in prisons under the worst conditions, 
people who have been uh, dug out their eye, women li uh, liberation fighters, uh, people who have uh, starved to death in that part of the desert. And then we asked Fiso Maklangu, let me tell you, I'm coming to the bottom line. It's like selective outrage of uh, Chris Rock. <laughs> we asked Fiso Maklangu to give us a space to respond to what he says in the Star when he was editor. I don't know if he's still, are you still editor? Yes. Now I'm going open public with this. <laughs> Allow us to respond to the conditions, the real conditions of the Sahrawi people. First, we thought we would understand that it's natural. The role of the media in the issue of human rights, if I can call you Comets Fiso, is fundamental. Because we know that everybody's sitting here with their cell phones. You need a piece of information, you can get information. Like I found out about that March of the 20th of March from Google, Kamil uh, uh, So mine is to say, if we are sitting at a table having a nice conversation and we are not on the ground understanding, are we giving a clear depiction? You were invited, do you remember we met you in Cafe 41? Uh, yes. And we invited you to the camps. And we are still waiting for you to come with that invitation because you are one of the key people we need. Do you know there is no media allowed into the uh, uh, occupied territories in the Western Sahara, those occupied by Morocco, no media. How are you going to even know? Some people ask, oh, where is Western Sahara? They think it's somewhere in, you don't know. It's right here. It's, it's in Africa and we cannot justify having a situation, be ashamed of ourselves to want to say we are free, yes, but our freedom must extend to um, the Western Sahara. I just want to, uh, maybe I can come back. Will you give me a chance? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, yes, I want to say this because I think you may not give me a chance. Um, the issue here is active, particip active uh, participation of people when the question is asked and the restrictions of the full economic participation. When we remove the full economic participation of, of, of our people, that is when we get them to be in a state of a lull, which pr places them as open prey to a populist kind of, okay, fine, what do we do? But how do we then open that floodgate of innovation and entrepreneurship for our people as a human right? And for me, that is the state of human rights in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. I think what you have done, um, you balance the panel <laughs> on gender with substantive input on issues of gender. Uh, and as a man, I always conscious that I'm raised in a patriarchal society. And there's always shortfalls in my own lenses because of my background. But the gender issue needs to permeate in all our debates, in all our society, in all issues that we raise, because women are the majority, not only in this country, but across the continent. And in most cases, they're in the forefront of these issues we are discussing, abused by the very same people that uh, they Raised anyway, mm -hmm. so I take I take your point, and uh, yeah, when we line up the next panel, I promise you, it will have a serious consideration. Of this so you said I'm, I'm, I balance the panel. <laughs> no, substantively. I said, I said substantively oh, okay. from content, <laughs> not, not numerically. <laughs> so that's how the balance is coming. Thank, thank you. I'm thanking you for that. She's not just here because she's a woman. That's exactly. No, no. Oh, so I, I, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go. I would like to avoid the conversation. <laughs> Don't put me in trouble here. Yeah. Um, I'd like to invite my brother here, yeah, um, um, Sheikh, 
and and then and then we, I think we're going to move from you okay. uh, to the deputy uh, minister. I'm not sure if the deputy minister uh, is online in Cape Town. No. Okay. So we coming to you and uh, <coughs> the sound, you know. There is that sound. Eh? I'd rather use one. Yeah, sweet, sweet. Okay, that is better. Perfect. Good day. I think a lot have been said before me, so mine is maybe to start with conclusion. conclusion. First and foremost, allow me to thank the organizers of this summit, the Higher Education Media, my brother Naidu, the African Diaspora Forum represented by many faces that I see here, but by the ED, Comrade Nicholas Ngabuto Mabena, a fellow panelist, DM Alvin Potes in absentia. I hope he will join us and close this session. Uh, our brother, my brother, Comrade Obed Pabela, whom I haven't seen for long. Yes. Uh, welcome, my brother. Thank you very much. And all the audience, the beautiful faces that we see here today, I say it, I greet you in the universal greeting of peace, which is peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, to our Muslim brothers who will be observing first tomorrow, I included, I said Ramadan Mubarak. Have a blessed Ramadan. But as you fast or start a whole month of actually fasting, spiritual nourishment, dedication to God, do not forget the mother continent, Africa, and South Africa, our host nation. Going to the topic itself, a lot have been said, but uh, I, do not, I do not know whether it is called universal actually declaration or Western actually declaration, but that is subject of discussion for another day. But one thing I would actually like to know is, when this actually declaration were actually debated, were written, were debated, adopted, and all that, our beautiful continent was actually missing in that table. I think it's only four African nations that were UN members, almost three by default, and only Egypt, maybe at that time an independent actually member. Two others was actually Liberia, which was actually a nation that they resettled those of us that actually they enslaved in all aspects mentally and when they actually these things was abolished they have no space for them but actually to bring them somewhere in Africa and even give the capital the name of their president Monroe and call it Monrovia. The other country was Ethiopia that was never colonized. The Italian went there in 1886 bought that bottle of Adawa and see these people are adamant warriors they don't want left them for Eritrea, to Somalia, Libya, and actually never come back. So, and the, that country was actually our host nation, South Africa, and the gruesome apartheid at that time. Out of the four, with the exception of South Africa, the others actually just took it and signed it, and then without any reservation at all. So the question I'd actually like to put is that, was there any gain? If we were not actually there, and this country is just unreservedly signed this declaration, and we were not there, is there any gain made? But prior to that, who are the forerunners of this actually declaration? These are countries that have colonized us. These were countries that have subjugated us into all the unnecessary atrocities, the likes of actually United Kingdom, that have colonized actually a sizable number of the continent, the France, Belgium mentioned actually that even the only country Spain that have colonized Equatorial Guinea, all of them were the forerunners of this and those people who have penned. While in one hand they were colonizing us, on the other line actually they were writing this declaration that will actually shape in one way or the other uh, how actually the forefathers of this nation will actually take it. The question actually is, is there any gain actually made from this? international declaration to us because at that time when it was declared a decade two decades later is when most of the african nation and uh, most of the names that actually we mentioned whenever we went to mention a forefather in the continent the likes of actually hayati jomo kenyatta of kenya 
the light of Julius Kambarage Nyerere of Tanzania, Ahmed Usekau Ture of Guinea, Abu Bakar Tafawa Belewa of Nigeria, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. These are names. Dr. Hastin Kamuzu Banda, I feel like if I forgot my Malawian brothers will not be happy with me. All these are actually the names that you hear that actually come to our mind. Is there any gain actually made from them? Yes, there was a little gain. It actually transformed African territories into independent state. Because now there were these actually beautiful wordings that were adopted unanimously by all these UN members. At least some of them took it and made the cry too loud to an extent that at least we got. And if you look at it, with the exception of Ghana in 58, somewhere there, many other African countries attained independence in the 60s, 61, 62, and 63. It also inspired our leaders to also actually think of having our own African charter, even though it came after 30 many years, after three decades, at least we could have our own charter that could actually reflect our need some liberation movements like the African National Congress, the Mponto Sizwe, the APLA Commandant, the PAC, and all this will actually take also lead and also come with actually their own actually charters after that. It is set basic standards of individual rights over the years and inspired several human rights organizations across the country, and that include even our host nation to come with actually a charter similar to that actually they borrowed. What in these days they call it actually the copy and paste. Uh, Post-independence now, in 1960s, 1970s, we attained independence, we have got now these charters, but what, ha what happened actually after that? When our leaders, and if you look actually back the history of our leaders, the Heston Kamuzo Band and Jomo Kenyatta who were in Britain actually on the rail working odds, now they became president and they are actually, you know, the life have transformed, they are no longer actually liberation leaders what did actually happen but when they see this they see this is now a time to actually accumulate immense wealth this is a time to be in power and this time limit actually that are put there are not actually going to be the thing what they did was actually now become auditorium dictators start changing actually the legal because i come from a british colonized country the legislative council what they wrote for us as a constitution and say that, man, here we are going to make a lot of wealth. So the more we stay, the more we stay, the better for us. And even started grooming their own children after 30 or 40 years. Because if you look at it, my sister Monsami have spoken about Kenya. If you look at actually the president, not current one, but actually Uhuru Kenyatta is actually the son of Jomo Kenyatta, the founding father. Born in the state house in 1963, grow in Kiambu, and a later state became the president of the Kenya. If you look at Raila Amolo Odinga, they call him the enigma of the Kenyan politics. He is a son of the first Kenyan vice president. Uh, and if you look all that, Mudavadi, the current principal secretary, is the son of actually Moses. If you look at Togo, Nasinga Beyadema was actually over 38 years. And by the time he was actually lived or actually departed from the world, his son actually Furi Nasinga Beyadema took over. So this was it. They started actually seeing it, you know, power into, went straight into the head. And they say power corrupt and absolute power corrupt, absolutely. So they see, you know, let's make some money. Another thing actually is the emergence of now the dictators that I have mentioned. And worst actually dictators in the continent, if you talk of Central African Republic, Uganda, the Alhaji Field Marshal Eid Amin Dadas and the like, the Jean Bedel Bokasa actually of Central African Republic, and etc. But at least the African Gate Reliefs come in the 1980s till 1990s and up to today. And this is a time that people could come out. Some actually talk of multipartism. The talk of actually, you know, the repealing of Section 22A in the Kenyan Constitution, for example. That, that paved way for multi-democracy in actually 1992. So at least the situation have changed actually better. And now actually you will find now the Togolese, the Kenyan, the Mauritius, the Tanzanians actually going out on the street and airing, but sometimes being actually faulty. My sister mentioned very recently when we have our own shutdown in South Africa, the Kenyans led by actually right uh, honorable Prime Minister Raila Odinga 
were also on the street and life were lost, properties were damaged and etc. So if we actually leave that, we now come to the state where we are. And we look into the situation of actually the West, whether they are interfering or actually they are improving situation in our country from the onset. And I think the former president of Mauritius mentioned when she took us in 1886 Berlin Conference, when they even started dividing our continent and put it in a table and saying that, you know, even the tiniest of nation like Spain, I'm going to take this part. France saying, I'm going to take this part. They were not thinking of us. And I do not actually think when they were also doing this declaration, they had actually the African in heart. So I think due to time, I'll have to skip a few things. But let's actually check. Looking at even the positive, now let's check directly. They are the West who only wants to control, milk us dry, so that at least whatever they gain is only a gain and nothing actually back. The United States of America is one of them. The rest is actually the European and etc. Then we have got developmental partners like the China, who are now actually coming, start actually building our infrastructure from zero. Certain countries that are independent for 50 years that have no even actually, you know, a sort of possible roads and now actually having a double carriage, three building our parliament, our airports, and etc. But when they came, actually the noise is now coming from the West. They do not actually want the China, they do not want the Emirates in Africa, they do not want the Qataris, they do not actually want the Indians. So they only want at least to make sure that the same way they enslave our forefathers, they enslave us actually mentally. And then the problems actually arise from here. And I'll give you only for two examples. When the Chinese came actually to uh, Uganda, they started with the Entebbe airport. But even when the process did not even commence, the cry was actually, no, 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 the corrupt M7 will actually default the loan and the airport will be taken. Same as also the SGR in Kenya, when they actually make the, the railway for Kenya. The moment actually they were about actually to start the business, the cry and the propaganda was too loud that the Kenyan corrupt Uhuru, Uhuru regime will actually default and also the country actually airport or the SGR and the rain will actually be taken over. So as actually the saying in Swahili, as I conclude now actually in a real sense, there, there is an adage in Swahili that says umbwa hafimaji akiona ufuko. A dog will not die as long as it sees the bank of the river. It will swim, no matter the depth of the water, no matter how actually you know far it is, as long as that dog sees the bank of the river, it will swim. Seventy years down the lane, there is actually a hope. A hope for the continent, a hope that actually we can bave our way. But I'm still worried on many small things. A nation of 54 countries, and I'm hearing from the former president, we are now 55. I think maybe she included the South Sudan of late, or maybe the Republic of Somaliland, I'm not sure. But the truth of the matter is we are 55 sovereign states, but what is Warren? I don't know, 54 or 55? Still 54. Still 54. Including? 55. Uh, okay, if we add the Sahrawi now, the Polisario. Okay. Actually, the number 55. 55. South Sudan. South Sudan, correct. <laughs> okay, look, look, looking at that, actually, we still have a long way to go. And the reason I said I see hope, but still there is a long way to go, is the fact that it worries me as an African. It worries me as an Pan African. When I see an, a tiny nation, and I call it tiny, maybe because of its geography, like Qatar or Emirat or Japan, calling our African 54 or 55 heads of state, some of them actually are now, now wearing tops and abayas, and you think, you know, they are Qataris, or women wearing saris, and actually men wearing lunges, and you think these are Indian 54, nation of 55, and a very tiny nation like Qatar can summon them, it actually worries me, but still, we have a long way to go, the long way to emancipation. And as a saying of our forefathers, as long as actually nations like actually Sahrawi, 
Arab Democratic Republic are complaining, then still Africa is not all free. But still, we are hopeful that we shall overcome all odds, and actually we will see the dreams of our founding father of actually having a united Africa soon in our lifetime. I thank you all. Shukran. Thank you. Um, as I was discussing with uh, organizers, I'm the director for the Center for Africa-China Studies at University of Johannesburg. So I think you will uh, agree with me that I never mentioned China. <laughs> <laughs> so it was uh, music in my ears to hear a panelist <laughs> mentioning. So my brother told me, <laughs> you record that I didn't say China. <laughs> but what you said, yes, yes, fundamentally, yeah, you're right. That we have um, kind of um, anti-developmental kind of narratives that we all <coughs> consume, uh, where we're told that building a road is bad for you. Uh, building a harbor is bad. Uh, we say that we really need more infrastructure as a human rights. Uh, we need more connectivity on the African continent to increase trade among ourselves. And when we talk about movement of goods, we don't just emphasize goods. When we build roads, use our rivers, uh, tourism, um, infrastructure is not about in vacuum. It's uh, through people, the languages that travel in these roads, this culture that we need to develop. Uh, music, as I always say, um, the really, I don't know whether to say this with the Deputy Minister on the panel, <laughs> that the greatest integrators of Africa today are the youth, and it's uh, Ama Piano. Uh, for those who are following music. They are in the forefront out there. We listen to music from Nigeria, our own local in, uh, in Tanzanian music. You pause and say, my entire schooling was to look at politicians. Yes, of course, politicians are in the forefront. They write, they do all sorts of um, projects. But practically, music, culture, drama, all these activities are in the forefront of integration. I think we need to rethink in terms of who are the drivers of Africa's in integration. So I really take uh, your views. Um, and I'm also grateful that, I mean, as I say, uh, it also speaks, uh, Comrade uh, Robert, I don't say this because you are Deputy Minister, um, that the freedom that I can say what I want to say in front of a deputy minister. Mm. And I know I'm going home to sleep peacefully. Very well. No one is going to be on my door. No one will knock at my door. <laughs> that in itself, yeah. it's a freedom that I also exactly. fought for. So with those bits, I pass to you. <laughs> A lot of issues, and but we are blessed, really, indeed, uh, to have you on this panel, so that we have these conversations. After your uh, input, we're going to open, on, and, and I'll also take the opportunity to invite Ambassador to have five minutes uh, input, then we open to everyone. Thank you. Prof, may I? Yes. The registration of Idi Amin, quickly. Mm. Uh, <laughs> of which he said the freedom of the speech is actually granted, <laughs> but freedom after speech is not granted. So be careful. <laughs> be careful. <laughs> no, no. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, for those uh, online, uh, if you can re-log in, um, the technical challenge we had has been solved. So please try to uh, re-log in. You should be able to see the visuals and and, and follow what's happening in this room, uh, digitally, wherever you are in the diaspora. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Program Director David Munyai, and my fellow panelists, Sfuso uh, Mashangu and uh, uh, my friend from the ADF. After not seeing each other for a long time, I'm glad to see you now. I'm back in the space that I was moved temporarily. <laughs> Uh, Welcome back. As a deputy chairperson of the ANC International Relations now. Welcome. And uh, so I will see more of you often, and they will definitely engage on matters. And also thanks to Minsemi, my daddy. Uh, we used to belong to some revolutionary house. Uh, and, uh, and as leaders, uh, young leaders came with that energy. I was there, and uh, but... I had to leave Parliament quicker, and as soon as I left, they also left to, us, to go somewhere else. <laughs> I'm glad to see you here now. And uh, the former uh, president of, of, of In Absentia now, Amik Fakiv from Mauritius, who spoke earlier. Can I do a disclaimer? Uh, I'm Ambassador uh, Mohammed uh, Besset, otherwise I will not be able to enter. Western Sahara again, if I don't acknowledge your, your presence here. What happened is that I just want to make a disclaimer. I was told I'm coming here to be an audience. So unlike Magdalene with such a huge book, I think you spend days and weeks preparing your input. <laughs> <laughs> and so if I speak out of turn, please blame the organizers. <laughs> that they invited me, enticed me to come as an, as part of you, the audience. And then who are supposed to be sitting here is the Deputy Minister Alvin Bodis. And I just said, hey, man, I'm sitting here, where are you? I'm just occupying your seat. He said, hey, look here, there was misorganization, unfortunately. Uh, the engagement with the office did not conclude, and therefore he thought this event is no longer there. And that is why you cannot even join online because you didn't prepare anything. So I came to you having listened to the, that's why I insisted, uh, program director, that let them speak first because they were already on the poster advertised as speakers so that I can hear what they were saying. Now I know their views and I can just respond to some, not all because of, of time. I also did indicate to the organizers that I'll be leaving four o'clock half past four because I have another event in Pretoria. So I just had to squeeze this one in honor of Moksin, my friend here, and then quickly dash out. But I'll want to be as brief so that I can interact with a few comments that might come from the floor or on the platform. With that being said, let me therefore say that uh, Africa is the richest continent with the poorest people and I think that's my opening remark. We are the richest continent but look at poverty and the people that are poor on this very rich continent. As you know that the minerals uh, complex, they dig, extract and then they all go to the port, port they go elsewhere to go and create jobs there because the primary to just extracting them is your primary activity. You take it as raw as is, whether it's timber, it's minerals under the soil or any other, we just export them. And then they come back as finished goods, three times the price, four times the price. Only those who can afford that for the majority can even enjoy the very fruits of their own minerals, timber, or anything. So that's the challenge that uh, Africa is still changing. I don't know when you say, Kwame uh, Nkrumah, you are now beginning to doubt his intention there. Only for that resolution, two of that declaration. Of that declaration. Yeah, that page 533. Okay. Of that book. Yeah. yeah, but otherwise, the intention was to really to decolonize Africa to liberate it, uh, they free it, and freedom schemes differently. Others were negotiated, others, it was uh, through the barrel of a gun until the victory itself. 
and, and the systems that Africa inherited are different. Uh, Western influence, majority of them, very few of them with African value systems. And I think uh, Magdalene just said it that our African value system is lost. He doesn't see it uh, because we just inherited uh, whoever was our colonizer and then we modeled, uh, replaced them as the governors to be the governing. And, and, and But obviously there was an improvement in some of the constitutions over time. That's why other countries had to go the first republic, the second republic and the third republic. Mm -hmm. And there's a call in South Africa that maybe we need the Second Republic. Republic yeah. I do not know. So that we debate, debate uh, that. we'll have to debate. And then the intellectuals and academia here must must really bring it to the fore. Uh, whether indeed, and I thought Eddie Maluga, one of your academic, has already confronted the issue. He wrote something to say we really need a Second Republic in South Africa. And, and, and what is it? Obviously, you will then be able to guide us. So now we have this uh, situation of Africa. And I'm going to conclude on Africa after just saying a few remarks uh, uh, as I begin with it. Uh, the second issue that is facing Africa is the skills deficit. We are not investing enough in the skills of our children. And yet we've got the youth dividend. God just gave us youth. Too many. Too many. <laughs> we are 60% go over and towards 70% country by country. But that 60% we are not investing. Look at what the West did in the 1960s, what they call the baby boom. Yes. When those children were born, they invested in them education. And some of them are as a result of the new innovations that you see today. They were born in the 1960s, 63, 64, 65. They are now the, uh, the, the Mark Zubex of today. They are Steve Jobs of today. They are making it, they are changing the world the way it looks in terms of whatever advances of innovation. Ours unfortunately, because we are not investing in them. They will die poor, and very soon Africa will be a continent of the aging population, which is poor. And Europe, and then West uh, Americas, they became an aging population of people who had delivered a better future for their children. They live a good life. Their countries are secured. And with us, they will go into, go into that poverty. And they are going to peace on us when we are dead in our graves to say, what are you really doing? Look how we are, and then because you do not invest in us. So this dividend, God says, here it is. The Asian tigers did invest in their own dividends at the time. Now it's the continent of Africa that is having that dividend. And we are not doing anything. And there is a challenge to the academics. I know that uh, governments also are responsible and the politicians. We really need to have that gathering of the minds and say what is it that we are going to do before it's too late. And what skills do we need? These enjoyments of the many minerals that we can find else, nowhere else except here. We are then to begin to develop the skills that can go to go and exploit, extract, benefit, and then make them finish goods and Africa to be an exporter of finish goods rather than an exporter of the raw materials. So if only we can then focus on education, we'll realize that goal. Without education, it means we still have to take our diamonds to India for polishing and cutting. India has really developed the skills in that. They're the best diamond cutters and, and polishers. And then and the latest demand mineral is lithium uh, for the 2035 when the electrical cars the and then for the batteries of those electrical vehicles. And where to get lithium, TRC, Zimbabwe, and the recent discoveries in Namibia. The queue of people that are running to those countries to secure every little 
mind that has uh, that rock, it's, it's so frightening. And Africans are just folding their arms and seeing it, and licenses being dished out uh, in the name of Babela, but behind Babela, uh, who does not have money because the financial capital is the biggest obstacle for, for mining. Then there are some people behind me, and then I sell the license to them, or they give me 10% and they take 90%. The batteries, where did they go? China, Germany, Canada, that is rock to go and do the battery. No skills whatsoever in Africa. No one talks about bringing the skills to where the mine is. And I think we ought to look at those things and say, unless we do so, uh, before I go to the human rights question, we are not going to achieve even that particular objective of uh, enjoying human rights. Because human rights is not just about people who are victims of war and conflict. Human rights, it's almost everything. Lack of water, lack of uh, bread on the table, lack of uh, access to the uh, sanitation facilities, latrines that are there that children are falling in. Uh, so it means we are not honoring those human rights objectives. Even by whatever little delivery that has happened, we are still far from uh, because of the, the challenges. So I think human rights has always been seen in the context of people who are victims uh, of the war and, uh, and who are victims of apartheid and the human rights lawyers emerge in bigger numbers, I think. Now there are no longer many in it last night. Uh, yeah, there are very few. There are still many. In, in the human rights? Yeah. No, it's more commercial now, yeah, and it crime, yeah, and so, yeah. no there's no more interest in human rights right. because we say we have arrived in South Africa. Yeah. But yeah. unfortunately, the way we have arrived, there are certain things that we have not yet arrived in. Okay. So if schools do not have uh, proper sanitation facilities, you know the dangers that are there. The ill health that is going to arise. If two people still do not have access to water, they go to the river, to the dam, to pick up their water and drink it as raw as is. Mm. Then it means that human rights have been violated and these lawyers will be alive, taking us to court and then really fighting and championing. Don't make so. us each come to a <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making you to each, but uh, some of the issues, because the cause in South Africa is the way to go now this nowadays. So we, we have that population that we need to, to really uh, invest in. And, 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 and then other issues of human rights will be your roads. Only 20% 20, 20 of the roads in South Africa are tarred. 80% of the roads are not tarred. And you think of the rural people, they've never seen a tar road if you have never been out of that area. Except if you go to town, the nearest town, small, medium town, then only then when you see uh, a, a tarred road. I know Western Sahara, you are still getting to get there. The day you get your freedom, those are going to be your challenges. How to bring and fast track these deliveries issues. We still unfortunately have the young people not in education, not in employment, and not in training. At the time when me and Musimi were sharing space in the revolutionary house, there were 2.5 million of them. Now there are 4 million. The number of the young people who are not in education, not in training, not in employment. They drop out of the school, uh, and I think the dropout, you can read it. Two million children enter grade one. By the time they write this, only 600,000 or 500,000, sometimes 400,000, they drop out because of the early pregnancies, their challenges in the family, social factors that contribute to their problem and so forth. So we are having four million. They are dissolutioned. They are angry, they are discouraged. They no longer even look for a job because they've tried it so many times. And then because of lack of education metric, that gives you a bit of access and tertiary that should be given more. Majority of them do not even have those things. And therefore they are just a time bomb ticking in South Africa. So 
we, 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 that's also a denial of human rights on them because we have not, we are not even assisting. By the time we came up with NESFAS and other those programs, a majority of them, they were already out of the system. Because the system now only caters those who are entering now. It doesn't even look back and say, but what about those that were left uh, behind because of programs only coming in? We, we have structural challenges in our economy, and the ownership of the economy is still in the hands of the few. And uh, it's just how we are tackling it, where majority of parties differ, those that are on the left. Uh, they still differ on how. Uh, is it radical economic transformation we need? A disruptor and collapse what is there and build a new. And then those who say, no, let's build on what we found gradually, a gradualist approach. But young people are impatient. They say, no, we can't wait in a gradualist approach. You know? And therefore, we didn't have to tackle that particular structure. And you tamper with it, there's somebody, big brother, with a whip and say, you dare touch sanctions imposed. You dare touch, will have, it will affect your economy and so forth, this investment and then so forth. And those things are just going on. DEE is a sugar coat. It didn't do anything. It just enriched a few people. And that's it. They don't own that economy. They are just enjoying the benefits of being a minority shareholders in, in the majority of those things. Human rights is also lack of water, electricity. I spoke about the water. Lack of access to housing, lack of access to clinic and health. So you gave figures. Uh, but I don't know, did you count routing when you say 800,000 in routing? We, we, this government delivered 4 million houses. I don't know where those houses are, but I don't know when you say 800,000 definitely in routing. That was, that was the report by the MEC of housing, Lebo Khamunayile, last week. Okay, so the rest of the, 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 the 3.2. They've been eaten by ANC councillors. <laughs> <laughs> Another debate for between me and you sometimes. <laughs> but obviously, we, we have delivered 4 million houses. We did connect people to the village with electricity, and we did not invest on the base. The investment was rolling and rolling. It was nice to see people lighting up their houses. Uh, and then when ESCOM came in, say, 1997, built the infrastructure that we are using to expand uh, it was only designed for few. It's going to collapse at some point. We did not listen. We dismissed them. And you know we dismissed them. Your favorite president. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, and then the regret people, unfortunately, by the time we started to build, it was too late. In a hurry, and mistakes happened in the construction. Because they say it takes 50, 10 to 15 years to build one power station. We, we wanted to build them in four years to eight years. And that is why Midupi is not struggling to go up. And that is why we still struggling to go up. But by the day we finish them, they will give you enough capacity for many, many years to come. Because majority of those that we build apart, they, they are coming to an end of their life. And, and therefore the capacity of not building in 1998 is costing us today. And that is why there's load shedding and, and, and where, where we are. But on social uh, programs and objectives we have achieved, 93% of South Africans have access to electricity. Whether it's available daily besides load shedding, those are the challenges that the municipalities now. Because their boxes are old, they are not changing them, they are not upgrading, they collapse, there's vandalization, there's theft also in our company. Where you find people with two weeks, three weeks, they are without electricity. Not because they don't have access, but because the distributor is not investing in the infrastructure. So is the case of the roads. We cities, municipalities are not investing in the roads. Where there's a tar road, there are now potholes. In other areas, it's bathholes. In other areas, it's swimming pools. <laughs> because we did not invest in the maintenance the upgrade, and because these roads are also getting old, we just didn't do. The infrastructure of the sanitation, leakages, sewer, spilling everywhere, 
is that level of investment. The population group we inherited in 1994 was 38 million fiscal. When we inherited South Africa, 38 million. Today was 61 million. Still reliant on the infrastructure that was built by apartheid. Mm. Which is very unsophisticated. Yeah. So we, we, we lacked that element of really investing and ensuring therefore that the base that uh, then and, uh, gives life to all this is it, it, done. So I think with those lessons, uh, we, we will turn the corner. Uh, money is not abandoned, in abundance, unfortunately. Uh, the fiscal is constrained and uh, we just have then to find way of biasly investing back on those infrastructure issues so that we could then get out of the situation. Because the more we don't invest, the more the investment uh, of private sector in building factories and, and then creating jobs, they will run away and then they go to the other countries. Uh, so for Africa to enjoy human rights, uh, the following have been proposed in the continent and that will be my parting remarks before I just touch a bit on Western Sahara. Uh, the Africa Agenda 2063. I think we'll, let's revisit that document, see if it does give us these uh, answers. And, uh, and, and, and I'm glad that uh, one of the panelists uh, referred to some solutions uh, that is, uh, I may shake, you did uh, refer to some solutions. But I'm just saying, let's visit these documents in the debates and see whether that document 2063, when the AU will be 100 years old, Africa we want must be exactly what I prescribed. Invest in the skills before 2063, less benefit, less on the economy, less then uh, uh, begin to invest on the infrastructure, on the social infrastructure, schools be better and everything because all the jobs will be created here and then everyone will be beginning to see the return of the investment just only on what God gave you, the dividend. If you don't do it, then 2063 come Africa will be the way it is. So the 2063 agenda, I think, is the one that I will really call to, to be one. The second other program that has been also uh, which, uh, for us to really achieve our human rights objectives is the, the issue of the, the good governance in the continent. I think some of the panelists touched on it and, uh, and the document that is a peer review on all of us is the African peer review mechanism. Look at how are we handling governance and leadership and also issues of management in those governance, whether who are there for the people or who are there for ourselves. And I think the peer review can also be guidance. We need to pursue it. There was NEPAT. I don't know what happened to NEPAT, uh, Magdalene. Mag uh, uh, okay. hmm? uh, yeah, I'm telling you what happened to NEPAT. Yeah. The blue economic print of Africa. That's how you branded it. Exactly. Yeah. And this was going to turn the economy of Africa and then we will then be competing with the most industrialized nation because it was calling for the industrialization in the continent. But still with the BRICS Bank? Well, the BRICS yeah. Bank is there. Yeah. It's there, but it's money. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let's say in August when we talk about it, one we are wasting the BRICS. Okay. Yeah, in South Africa. So I think we need to then begin to say, Nepal office is still there, is in South Africa somewhere, hibernating there. I don't know why is it hibernating. Ambassador, uh, they say probably as ambassadors of Africa, I hope you are taking about it to say, why is it disappearing from the radar instead of it? Because it was a hopeful document. Every critic, every academia, every, all intellectuals, civil society, they say, this is it. And then, why is it? Is it a suffering of implementation that we see in South Africa? It's all over the continent, maybe. Exactly. Yeah. So, if we could really begin to revive that, we have answers that are lying in that particular document. Uh, so, I will then say, call it as part of the solutions to achieve our goal 
of the human rights in Africa. And, 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 and then we, 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 we have now the latest innovation of the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement. Uh, but the trade will still be difficult for if roads that networks all the countries, if flying to, to Western Sahara as I did uh, two months ago, I flew to Amsterdam because there was no direct flight to, and there's not still direct flight to Western Sahara. It's coming April. Uh, no, it's, uh, <laughs> it's Algeria. Yes. Yeah, Algeria is now going to be flying, and that will give us very good access to Western Sahara. <laughs> but for now, I had to go to Amsterdam, stayed about eight hours in the airport, and then connected to France to spend about seven hours. I left here on Friday, I arrived Monday morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. on my way there. <laughs> yeah. And then on the Monday when I arrived, I spoke and I left so that I can then reconnect together with my comrades that I was with there. Uh, I just spoke, I spent an hour, two hours in Western Sahara, having spent Friday, Saturday, Sunday on the road. Yes. Yeah. From France, I arrived in Algeria. As, as I arrived, the flight was leaving because the French was, uh, airline was, was, was late. And I saw through the window uh, the flight going to Western Sahara leaving. They said, go and sleep at the hotel, we'll leave on Monday morning. <laughs> and the Monday morning is, is really, really morning. Three o'clock in the morning, I'm in another flight <laughs> to, to reach the place where I was going to. Uh, so the, 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 the goods there for if I have to sell flowers to Western Sahara, it means the flowers will first have to go to Europe before they come back to Africa. Anything I produce, uh, the train network is bad. The railway that connects Africa from south, it ends in Zambia. Uh, there's just 60 kilometers to reach Burundi, and uh, no one is investing in that. And then from the north, they all end up somewhere in Cameroon, Central Africa. is a big hole. There's never been any rail network there. So we need them to begin to connect the rail so that people and goods can move with ease. And then the roads, uh, I'm glad that the N1, uh, that, uh, uh, who is this? Uh, uh, roads, Cecil Roads built from Cape uh, to Zimbabwe where he fell and died. It was a mission for him to connect to Cairo. That's why they were calling Cape to Cairo. But he died with him somewhere in Zimbabwe. But now it has been connected to Tanzania. Now it's also moving by the new governments uh, towards uh, reaching Cairo. Uh, so, but there's a north-south link that is poor infrastructure. East-west also poor infrastructure. And there's a program called the Infrastructure Plan of the AU. That is there also. So. Uh, it will connect us uh, and make the continent one. But also the people will stand visiting each other, understand each other, know each other. Uh, probably we might even go back to the days when the continent was one. But it's a journey that we ought to travel. But there's a lot of other decisions that have been taken. One common passport for Africa is still not there. There are decisions of the AU that are there. So that I don't even have to have visas so long as the passport records I've arrived in South Africa, I've now passed to Botswana. If anything happened uh, on my journey, then they, I become one of the suspic suspects that I might have committed crime. Uh, that's what we're saying. So that no one then remains undocumented because that passport then will be an enforceable passport for all to travel and it's a visa on its own. And, and that's how you need them to begin to record. But some countries, we still need to help them with African population register. The register, they don't have. It's only you and a few others that have a, a population register. So all of us, we need them to develop. We are now going to the fourth IR, the fourth industrial revolution, where technology is easy, that these phones are in the hands of our people. Telecommunication, very weak. The cables are landing on the continent that connects west to India and Asia. They pass the continent, they land in different spots, but connectivity 
in Africa is poor. We are still not even on 5G, a majority of the countries. Very, very low in terms of the speed and, 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 and connectivity. So those are the investments that are said. They are, they are decisions. And I think the human rights can only be achieved if we implement on those things. And then we can then deal with the minimals. Uh, that will still remain as human beings. You know, we are human beings. We do wrong things all the time. And and, and therefore, that's, that will be my call on this. And, and I think I've touched Western Sahara a bit, uh, but uh, uh, the solidarity with the people of Western Sahara is what we are calling for now, as I now put the mic away from me. They are in occupied, in the, in the occupied territories. As you said, media cannot access those points. Uh, and then a the lot of them are in exile in Algeria on the border with, uh, with what is their country. And then they are in refugee camps. They don't have books, they don't have clothes, they don't have shoes, children don't have toys, children don't have things to play out with. And those human rights elements that we need to call South Africans to do, let's all donate what we no longer use package them in cargoes and go and that is international solidarity that I'm calling for. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Um, you've touched on a number of um, issues and rightly so. Um, and when we talk about the agenda 2063, I mean, I was just doing my own calculation. Inshallah, maybe I'll be 94 years old. Inshallah. Inshallah. You'll be 94 years old. Inshallah. Inshallah. So I, uh, um, I really get worried if we're discussing uh, 20th century challenges unresolved. Uh, we're still talking about. Uh, Minister, you touched on the issues of the digital world. Uh, and I hope the advocate would, uh, another session, to talk about the new rights. Right to data, your own data. And uh, we, time's unaware that from the moment you wake up up to now, you have created a lot of uh, digital footprint and your own but you have no right to your own data there are people who are harvesting that data as we sit the data that is in here with every picture with everything that you look at it's recorded it creates a pattern of who you are that's why you have adverts tailor-made for you. It depends where your eyes are. Any split of a second you are looking at a picture, it's recorded as your interest. Algorithms gives that and channel a particular type of adverts just for you. So, even our own countries, 55 and the AU, don't have access to their own data. The data we have on the African continent sits in California. Yep. All of it. Yeah. Our personal data, even at times, what we consider as national data. Number of hospitals we have, who is sick in the country, how many are dying on a daily basis. That data is vital and supposed to be owned by the country. It has huge implication on national security. We have no right to that. We have to buy it. So when we talk about data sovereignty and we talk about the private data, we are always distracted that uh, no, 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 sorry, sorry, country spying on you and all other. 
while people are harvesting our data, personal and national data. Therefore, when you talk about rights, the right to that data, it's something that we need to open that debate. There's little access to digit, digital for our people, but we need to start talking about it. If we fail to develop our own clouds, where the facility to store the data, why can't we operate at the regional economic community level and build data for SADAC, data for West Africa, Central, in a way that uh, smaller countries are unable to develop sophisticated data centers, are able to be assisted by bigger countries. And at an AU level, these are issues of the future. Yeah. Lithium, the future is going in a way that um, for those who are following the chat um, GPT, I mean, I mean, this is a new language, on, um, on a daily basis there are updates that it is going to render some of us as professors unemployed, but we're looking at it from a threat, they're, they're positive. But we also are failing to understand that our culture, our languages, are marginalized in this digital world that is fast evolving and moving. As in the past, in colonialism, is a new colonialism. Mm. Huh? Digital colonialism. Mm. So these are new issues that we need to confront on when we talk about human rights at the global level. That we need to ensure that our civilization is digitalized in a way at equal par with the Chinese civilization, with the Western civilization. And this tendency that we need to just as consume certain, uh, we, and therefore we really need to think seriously as we move forward uh, with some of these challenges. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and those online, um, I'd like to open now for comments, questions, but before I do so, I would like to welcome the ambassador and give you five minutes just to give us uh, that honor of Western Sahara uh, issues that we are aware of. Thank you. May I? Okay, you can come forward. Okay. So, no, no, no. They want, they want to hear so that you can you be can in their, in their, in their, in their video. <laughs> yes. You can stand for the problem. Yeah. yeah, there's a lady recording. Yeah. Hi, hello. Good evening to everyone. Good evening to the panelists, to Professor David, whom I knew 20, more than 20 more years than ago. Years. Yes. To Sefis Mushlangu, to my brother Sheikh, to Advocate Mohammed. Special thanks to my brother, Comrade Minister, Minister Ovid Babel. It's a great pleasure to be with you here. Uh, the topic is the state of human rights in our continent. You can't talk to all this study that state of, uh, of situation of human rights in our continent unless we uh, take stock that we have the continent that is totally colonized, except a few countries, a, country, a continent that faced colonialism, slavery, uh, apartheid, genocide of Rwanda, and many, many other background and uh, baggage that we keep on and its impact on our daily life and on the future of our, uh, of our generations. Nevertheless, despite all of that, there is a slight progress. Africa has its own uh, charter of human rights and people's rights, which differ them with this people's rights, differ the African system of human rights from the European system of human rights, from the United Nations from, uh, of human rights, from Americas also, which have their own system. We have our system, which is charter, commission, court, and an arsenal of, uh, of uh, conventions and protocols that has been uh, ratified by the majority of our, of our countries, of our 55 countries, uh, members of, of, of the EU. Uh, the human rights, it's uh, as you all know, there is the first generation which is the political rights, then uh, organized by the charter, then there is the second generation which is social economic rights, which is universal uh, also convention on uh, social economic rights. Then there is the third 
generation which is uh, this uh, reproduction and environmental and the right of sexuality and gender issues which is the third generation that is still keep growing and keep it. when it comes uh, the problem that and uh, the issue that uh, president of, of Mauritius uh, raised about uh, corruption Corruption is not longer only uh, government uh, stealing some of the public resources. Now, corruption is used as an, a lethal arm to, to, to attack and to corrupt people. So, you know, today, maybe you follow the news, there is uh, six members of European Parliament arrested because Morocco have bribed them. It's Europe who has the lecturing us about human rights. It's the vice president of the European Parliament in jail because Morocco bribed her to pass a resolution on Western Sahara or to be quiet over Western Sahara. With another five members among them, president of the Human Rights Commission of the European Parliament. Uh, she's in jail. Cosolino, you name is the names of Cosolino, Panzeri, uh, Anna Arena, um, the other parliamentarian, uh, Tarabella of Belgium, and many other, and 60 other members of the European Parliament are under investigation because Morocco have been distributing bags of euros using their, their intelligence and their, and, their, and their diplomacy to now that is Europe because they have the, the ability to process and to prosecute those who were bribed by Morocco. In Africa, they are bribing more than they are doing in Europe. Uh, ambassadors, uh, uh, big uh, dignitaries, uh, officers of African Union, like the, for, the former chief of staff of Madame Zuma coming from Cote d'Ivoire, who was bribed to pass somewhere. Morocco used, uh, developed the use of uh, corruption, not only inside Morocco with the Moroccan elite, but also to use it as a tool to fight against the Sahrawis and against the United Nations, against Europe and against the African Union. So that's a new use of corruption as a new violation of human rights, as a tool, a little tool that's in addition to Pegasus, uh, to drone, Israeli drones, to Pegasus, to many. When we say decolonization, it's only Western Sahara. Comrades, we have uh, three countries in the continent that are still in a non-finished process of decolonization. There is Comoros, the most beautiful island, it's Mayotte. It's under the occupation of France, and France is refusing to negotiate with the Comores, uh, the Comores government. And Comor doesn't care about decolonization of its own territory, sadly enough. Uh, last week, uh, co uh, brothers from uh, Madagascar have died trying to join Mayotte. In, in a boat, and they, uh, six, 16 of them have, have passed away, like exactly what's happening to Europe. There is Mauritius, uh, Diego Garcia, and Ch uh, Chagos. Then there is four islands of Madagascar, also under occupation of France. And there is La Réunion, which is not far from here. Then there is uh, 17 million Morocco, which Morocco have sold out to buy the silence of Spain towards Western Sahara. So decolonization is still a problem for our continent. The goal that we have set that our founding fathers and, and the great leaders of our continent to start still is not, is not finished. Yes, Western Sahara is the biggest territory, but there are other peoples and other territories still under a joke of colonial domination in those, in those countries. Today, as we speak, Morocco have, after 30 years refusing to uh, run away from African Union, have paid lip service, have signed the Charter of, Af uh, of African Union, have ratified it, the king have signed it, the government have adopted it, the parliament have passed it, but they are refusing to implement it. They don't care about uh, uh, respect of, uh, of frontiers and the independence, they don't care about the human rights of the Sahrawis, they don't want the African Union to play any role in the, in the, in the resolution of the conflict. They daily violate the human rights of the Sahrawis. Last week was a report by the Department of State of America, the worst since many, many years. Of course, human rights, unfortunately for the West, was a tool to fight the East. But once the East is no longer there, the West no longer funding the human rights organization doesn't do anything about human rights. Uh, since Abu Ghraib and uh, Guantanamo Bay, when America 
empire have been tainted by human rights violations, human rights become a secondary, a secondary goal for the West to advocate for. But there are a lot of good people really in the West and in the East and Africa who care about human rights and defend them. Uh, there is also the problem of resources. The Western Sahara conflict is mainly about resources. It's the richest country in the world. It is the biggest uh, stock of phosphate, the biggest stock of uh, uh, fisheries, of iron, gas, uh, gold, uh, uh, phosphate, uh, and a very small population. That's why the conflict keeps on, and that's why the European have forget about their own constitution and their own regulation to keep fishing with Morocco in Western Sahara uh, waters and for Western Sahara phosphate. When it comes to resources, the West doesn't care about human rights, doesn't care even about a ruling of the very European Court of Justice, which says these deals are illegal. But for Spain and France, they don't care. They continue to fish regardless of what, the court, what their own court have said. This is uh, we the very dangerous trends in the world that we are facing. They don't care about the rule of law or the ruling of the court or the human rights charter or the resolution of, of the Constitutive Act of Africa. They just want the resources and that's it. Uh, on maybe they will go back to colonialism and to slavery again as they started in the last centuries. That's why we have to be vigilant, we have to be alert, and we have to defend our rights. I thank you, Professor uh, Moderator, Professor David Mane. I thank all the panelists and the public. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Um, I would like, I've noted a number of hands, one, two, three, any more? I'm going in that order. I start with Comrade Tabo right here, my good comrade right yourself. I go right at the back and then I come here right in front, yourself. Your end was up, right? Okay, you're here. I mean you. Okay, and then I'll go back there. So let me start, and then you'll be the last one in this round. Uh, can someone assist me, please? Thank you very much for the opportunity to ask the question and thank you very much for the panel. Uh, my question and, and comments are directed at Obet. I think I can call you Obet. Uh, we are eight mates. Yes, almost. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, we, I think you, you spoke quite well. I mean, uh, outlined the problems and the challenges that we have as a continent. And uh, I mean, frankly, about the need to beneficiate resources. You spoke about how we fail in young people and all of other things, I mean, governance issues and problems. Your critics, your political opponents, will say that uh, you spoke as a victim, and you say it's typical of the governing party. But I'm not, uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not I'm not that. For me, what, what's important is, you know, I mean, mistakes have been made in the past, horrible ones, you know. But we, we need to look to the future, right? I mean, our leaders who really stood up for this continent, we know what happened to them, they were murdered. Quite early on, before that, the ideas could actually uh, gain much ground and influence a lot of us. You know, we will influence much later. I mean, I've always been of, of a view that the problem that Africa has now is that uh, we don't have visionary leadership that is selfless and is really is concerned about the advancement of Africa and Africans. You spoke about Asian Tigers, you know, I mean, at some point where at, at, uh, at Linipeds are at about the same level with some of them, and it's the outlook that they took on life that made them Asian Tigers, and we're still wallowing in poverty, and, you know. We do say that there's a realization, I mean, you are government, I mean, it's good that you represent government and <laughs> probably have to represent the entire 55 uh, nations, uh, governments. A new realization that there's a need to do things differently, that uh, we cannot do th both that way, that we, our leadership is in the pockets of foreign forces that 
are, are bent on destabilizing the continent for their own interest. And then things are going to happen di uh, differently. And then with leadership that is selfless, visionary, and doesn't care only about its pockets. Is that happening or likely to happen in our lifetime? Uh, can all panelists please jot uh, questions as we go? <coughs> we will we'll, we'll share questions. <coughs> hey, 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 thank you so much, I'm Mabuto Nicholas Mapena. My comments is based on the presentation by my brother, Sviso Mashang. Uh, we agree with him and agree with everyone that the sanctions in Zimbabwe must go. And there's no question about that. But, but we think the characterization of uh, the collapse of the Zimbabwe economy, uh, if we are to link it only to sanctions, we might be missing the point. Because what we must place on the table is that uh, post-independence, we continued with the national plan in Zimbabwe, which were adopted by the Rhodesians for the first decade of our independence. But in 1991, we abandoned the national plan adopted the neoliberal policies, economics, economic structural adjustment program. If you then trace the influx of Zimbabweans to South Africa and to neighboring countries, it was not to post the imposition of sanctions, which were saying they must go, but it was after the introduction of the economic structural adjustment program. I, I will not go back to the formation of ZANU in 1963 as an imperialist project because I think uh, this is also missing in the political discourse. That is, ZANU was formed as an imperialist project to curtail the influence of Soviet Union, which was supporting ZAP at the time. And, and in order to curtail that influence, you had to split the liberation movement ZAP and establish, this, uh, and establish ZANU. And uh, the comments by the former a, a diplomat of the United States in the 1980 when Zanu won political power. He said it was a victory for Western democracy because the anticipation was that Zamp was going to win in 1980, uh, which was going to make it easier for Umkondo season to establish their military bases in Matebele and South. And when you also start to ground the operations, a, it, it actually operated within the military corridor that was to be used by MK from Zambia to South Africa through Matibele North. So while we understand and agree that uh, sanctions are a problem and they must, they must go, but we should not just leave it there, otherwise uh, we will not find the correct solution to the problem. Because what Zimbabwe needs today is return back to national planning build a national democratic economy linked to devolution of power to the people. Thank you. Um, yes, at the back. Good afternoon. Can I stand? What, what, what you wish to stand or sit in front? You can come in front if you <laughs> you can also dance, they say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they say you can dance as well if you're a piano for you. I greet you, you know, Mr. Mary Sylvia. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ezra Kizzi. A Hutu, a Rwandan Hutu from Rwanda. Uh, not be funny. I walk here from Rwanda by feet to here. Take me four good years. Four years to come and decide. A long track. Mm. Now, <clears throat> I have been here almost 20 years so far because I come here in 1998, uh, 25 December 1998. So this far, I still here. So when I come here, it's my first time to realize something called freedom. It's my first time to realize something called freedom. Then I came here when I was about 25 years so far. So I come to then realize freedom here in this country. After 
operation. And then when you look at it, our operation of going through as Africans, we were pressed by our, our own brothers. The same, kind of same scale. Sometimes we say the same ethnic. This is very, when I, I think about the own Um So since I'm here, I come to realize that freedom is for everyone. I always, sometimes when my colleagues say, Kore, Kore, must go big room, I say, no, 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 I want to be here. I want to have this freedom like yours. So I should go there and be a president. But I'm enjoying the freedom. So uh, since I realized that the freedom is for, to, uh, is for us all, and then I, as I said, I come by feet from Rwanda this far. So I pass uh, uh, Congo, Tanzania, Kenya, Malawi, Mozambique. And this was this far. So I realized that the, the, the only freedom, only, only freedom means the freedom I find it here. We are enjoying freedom here in this country. There's no way else you can enjoy a South African freedom. It's very unique. Mm. You never find it anywhere else. Mm. Is it here? That's why we should understand and respect this country. By all means. Now, we, we say uh, we are oppressed by West. That is true. But remember, the West they never come straight to us. They choose one of our brothers to oppress us via our brothers, and our brothers will be going to oppress us indeed. Now, we are in this country, and you know how this, this country comes from. <laughs> Why us? As, because myself, I say us, South Africans, because I'm not. Even though I don't, I'm not South African yet, but I am in South Africa. I'm living in South Africa. I enjoy South African freedom. So I'm wrong here. So always when I address, I address we as South Africans. Now, we have find that we, we have a unique freedom in this country. Therefore, we should not always be uh, looking a harp from West why we have something to do like here, right here. Now we say, okay, we are oppressed by Kagame. Kagame is the ethnic Tutsi. He's not even made a 5% of population of Rwanda. He's oppressing 90% of the population. And we cry for the West coming to help us one year here in South Africa. South Africa has the capacity to do that. To liberate us. If Kagame from, from Uganda went to America to train, by Seiya and the military, everything, and after that can be uh, come in Rwanda, exercise the ex education from the USA to come to oppress us. Why don't you do it here in South Africa? As a black, as African, why you see that the government is oppressing Rwanda and Rwanda, but you're here as Africans? Why don't you also make a plan as Africans to liberate ourselves than to the pain don't waste? So, South Africa, as I said, that is a, is a model of freedom and democracy. They should start behaving like other Western countries. Mm. Yes, if you come from here, uh, allow me to go to the military training. Allow me to go to the police. Allow me to go to intelligence. Allow me to do things according to other, other Western do. If you come from Rwanda and go to America, you go to Syria, train by Syria, why don't any person train me, train us all? Any people can, can train Zimbabweans, can train Somalians, so that we can go and overthrow those dictators not waiting for the West. Why do we have everything here? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think we, we have, I, I wanted to come back, or oh, is the back. Can I have, uh, it's my brother. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Um, you can your name and your Okay, my name is Serge Luamba from Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, I thank you very much, the panelists and the organizers of the, the talk of today. Uh, my point is, um, it's almost in the same line with the, my comrade from Rwanda did. What I wanted to say, on the other side of the leadership, I've noticed one thing here in Africa with our leadership. Congo have been um, aggressed by Rwanda for so many years. It's proven, black and white. But by the same time, 
in all the forum, I can only minus my brother there on the left, from the editor to the minister. In your reports, in your academic reports, human rights committee uh, reports, government reports, they never, ever, ever condemn Rwanda. In all reports, even recently, the president of France was in DRC. He struggled to give that point, to make that point. Then, by the same time, we are using Rwanda, a dictator, proven black and white. You're talking about 100 and, 100 and something uh, women abused? That is nothing. You're talking about genocide in Rwanda? That is nothing. Congo since 1994 up to date. It's 10 million people have been killed. Those are proven by UN. How many commissions, uh, how many reports have been given by different missions of union, um, of U, uh, UN in DRC? African leaders, international leaders, all of them, they are closing eyes and using Kagame, a dictator, as a model of democracy. That is, I don't understand that. How are we going to develop ourselves as Africa? We are neighbors for life. We have to live together as Africans with a certain respect and dignity and sharing the resources of Africa. As I said, South Africa is the big, is the big brother. It's supposed to use its position in all angles to fight those kind of system. Yes, I understand there's different um, I can call rules and regulations, uh, report of the UN and all those things. We understand them. Let me take an example. In the house, the mother is busy cooking. She's busy ironing. The father is sitting there, relaxing. And an intruder come in the house and steal. Are you going to chase? Are you going to, Mama will keep on cooking? Or all of us, we are going first to chase the intruder. That is the problem. Yeah. It's so many are good. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I... Um, okay. I can get really... Uh, <laughs> yeah, with some of these uh, issues. Um, I'm looking at time, it's 4.34. I'm mindful that the minister is to leave and will uh, allow him to, I think we'll be able to answer some of the questions. Not from a government perspective, but from our own perspective. Um, um, I'll just very briefly say in 1999, under the UN, I was on a mission to Rwanda to assist the re-establishment of the university, National University of Rwanda in uh, um, um, far away from, uh, from, from Kigali, or Chigali as you always put it. Uh, in the class that I was in, one student during break time came to me and said, you're very brave. I look at you, you're a Hutu. And then I said, my brother, it's first time for me to realize that I'm a Hutu. Um, and um, the narrative that defines us um, colonial narratives and the danger that it comes with. So, I would like to declare myself I'm, I'm Hutu, I'm Tutsi. <laughs> I am, I'm Hutu, I am Tutsi. So, so that we are clear that uh, when we talk about identities and as much as we have rights to them, they can also be quite dangerous uh, in terms of what I personally so when I was in Rwanda, um, what I continuously reading, the massacre of people in the DRC. Um, and therefore we have to be really serious about human rights issues. 
among ourselves as governments and as scholars, civil society, and 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 name names. But I think we don't have enough time to go deeper into these issues. Mm. My brother, I think you haven't uh, really perused all the literature. If you follow some of our writings, you'll see. I, I don't want to parade mm -hmm. and, 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 and tell you that I've, I've written um, or, or my brother I or any other. I, we, we have <laughs> written on these issues. We have written on these issues. Mm -hmm. And we just don't want to limit ourselves on one yeah. particular country. We have a continental issue that we are handling. But we welcome your views. I'd like to uh, start with the yeah. minister of a few minutes uh, he has, to a few, few words, and then we allow um, him to rush to another point. Sorry. I apologize about not having time. I wish I could be staying, but other duties cause. Let me deal with the one that was directly pushed to me about the lack of visionary leadership, uh, which is selfless. Uh, what is it that we're going to do differently going forward? Are we attending to this issue or not? Definitely, we are correct that there is uh, that depth, the lack of depth of leadership that is selfless visionary but everybody knows what they want ought to do but the brave element of it standing up uh, i think it's what is lacking and, and and when we see african leaders coming together you no longer get that inspiration that you used to get in the past and then i think it could be a phase where we have a kind of leadership that is maybe either too cautious or too diplomatic, and, 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 and as a result, the lack of punch the bubble gum, and then say, this is it, this is where we're going. A lot of those who had tried in the past bend their fingers uh, to some extent, uh, but I think the issue is there, we are engaging and are talking, and obviously the young people are not beginning to say, uh, you old people, please can you move? We we want now to take over and and then really push. Yes, we will be moving and we are gradually moving, but we also want to impart knowledge to the young people because we can't lead without knowledge. Uh, we may have leadership qualities, we might be spoken, but there's element of experience and knowledge that we need to impart so that as you lead with that passion, the guards, the bravery, you know how others might have traveled and why they fell along the way. So that you also do not fall. Uh, and then and but otherwise we, we are really listening to that that young people is your time, you need to now begin to move in numbers into the structures of leadership across not just in government, not only management, but across civil society organizations and everywhere. Because we need a caliber that can really say, and I think it's amazing across all countries, the younger generation, but all of those Franco Africa, it used to be a sleeping area where they were shy and afraid of France. But the younger generation that is imagine that they talk and say all those agreements that the ADA agreements must come to an end. We want now to be long to the continent and be self-sustaining and then be able to. So it's encouraging. And I'm, I'm not just saying maybe just when it's going to break so that we can see them. But it's encouraging. The voices are there. Listen to the young people. You'll have hope that the continent will one day be the good leadership of the young people. And I think that's what we need to encourage bring them on and then really let them, but guide them proper, give them the right tools, so that at the time when they take over, they have the necessary tools then to, to lead. I think that, that was my only question that came to me. The others have answered it uh, for, for me, uh, 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 Prof, and, and therefore let 
doctor. I don't know. He's still doctor or prof or both. <laughs> doctor <or> prof. <laughs> they say prof is higher than the doctor, so, so I'll say prof to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. My apology, I have to, to quickly jump out and, and then deal with that situation. But let me then, as I do, there's convention also that guides us as leaders from one country to the other. You don't just wake up and say, I declare all on you, uh, I, I train and arm you, go in and, and then remove the loan. Because AU is a convention that guides on how to engage and manage matters. Right? The only country that we know has a liberation struggle going on, that's still going fighting in a war, is Western Sahara. The rest of others, you gain your independence, you got your freedom, it got sabotaged along the way, your freedom rights were taken, and you go to the elections, but you still vote the same people. And we are wondering, say, but what's wrong? Because we say the Sututsis are 5%, but then the people vote him into power. And once a person is democratically voted, it's not easy then to then go in and, and ruffle that person. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. This house is welcome here. This is the event to Russia now. Okay. I'll, I'll put my love to put in. So, but there are dynamics of the ISIS. We need to just... I want to update one last two minutes. This issue of the... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to provoke you. Um, thank you. See you soon. We are See left. We are left with five minutes. So I'm going to give each um, remaining panelist one minute each, and then uh, we we'll close. And I think all of us need to get on the road with load shedding and potholes and other stuff. Um, okay. So I start from this side. One minute. No, mine will be very short. Listening to the story of Hezron is the story of every migrant in South Africa. Whether one trek for four years or for four months or one year, this is the story of every migrant. But one thing I'd like to say to Hezron and to all diaspora members here <coughs> is that they said words can be, with, can be weapons. The problem with Rwanda in 1994, in that time of madness, was using ethnics actually in the wrong time. We are African and nothing short of that. Do not take us back to ethnicity where you distinguish us between Hutu, Tutsi, and this Twa, and etc. The other thing I want to actually say is that when you mention your surname, the thing that came to my mind was that actually you are the Kabazela of actually Rwanda, Mukize. Uh -huh. Rather go look for this name, you know and see what is the relationship between the Kabazelas, the Mukizes here in South Africa, and the same surname. And that is the same thing I told my sister, Zingi Zakuma, when actually, you know, the surname, which can actually go all over places. The other thing, the manner in which South Africa treated foreigners, migrants, or even the Rwandans, giving asylum to a chief of staff of actually the most brutal dictator you mentioned, is actually a step that South Africa have actually gone for. I don't think it goes well with Kagame when his former chief of staff and the founder of the Rwanda National Congress, Chief actually Nyama, Lieutenant General Kayumba Nyamasa, was hosted in this country. The manner in which they treat the death of the former spy chief, Colonel Karagea, is something that we need to applaud. But it is us who are supposed to actually take these actually dictators and actually make a lot of noise. The brothers like Professor, the academic, the advocate, Sister Mine, Sefiso, the editors, and others actually eminent will help us if we want to actually take this actually course far. But we mustn't put ourselves behind. We must actually come front knowing that there is actually even a price to pay for that, and the price can even be death. Let us not shy actually from the plight, and let us congratulate South Africa for the good work it's doing as a big brother in the continent. Uh, thank you very much. Somebody asked a question about, uh, in fact, the minister's response was why, <coughs> you know, Africa continues to elect leaders that oppress them. 
and I just thought, you know, solely in his absence, I must respond. It seems like there's a thinking in the ANC that African elections are actually independent. There's a, some illusion that elections in this continent are independent. I mean, it's an illusion to assume that uh, Uganda is going to vote out Museveni and Museveni is going to allow it and then is going to move out of the state house and then the young singer is going to him and his family are going to enter the state house and then he's going to you know to face charges of all he has done in Uganda in the last almost 40 years that's an illusion the 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 symposium that elections happen to free Africans and elections are, are credible independent because overseers say that they are is an illusion so one of the facts that we talk about human rights is the dignity of elections is the fairness of elections and i don't think that's an area we've really gone into one of the reasons we're going to salvage this continent is to look at how to ensure credible electioneering uh, they are they are not credible in in two ways because of the social impact of, of food parcels going into to the old villages mm -hmm. and sort of erupting the minds of old citizens to make them believe that you are going to do this every day for the next five years. And uh, the second illusion is that the assumption that if you make an X on the ballot and you have many, many Xs, that person that you elected will actually lead that country. It never ever happens. If that was the reality, Africa would be a different place. So I don't know where the ANC's mind is on, on, on elections or rigged elections for that matter. But I think it's a discussion that we, we must open because it's for human rights. I want to make this point uh, about migration before I close. Hmm. Migration is not just an African phenomenon. Uh, and <clears throat> we need to adapt our language. Part of my, my space and work, of course, mm. is narratives and language. The, there's something wrong with the descriptions that we use to define African politics. We call it, uh, you know, porous border migrations and, and foreign nationals or illegal nationals or where it is coming into the country. Migration is not a new thing to, to Africa. Right now, as we speak, people are migrating from Ukraine to Belarus, they've always been, mm -hmm. from Belarus to Poland, from Russia to, to Poland and to Belarus, many of them without passports, but they understand that there's a war and there's an event. Uh, from Morocco, between that belt called the Belt of Gibraltar, people are swimming and dying over the water because they want to, to go to Spain. Uh, for a long time, living in, in Botswana, people will just see your aunt across across the fence she lives over there. To assume that a child who, who goes and buys bread in Musina uh, across the border or across the fence from Zimbabwe to go and buy bread in Musina and goes back home has committed an atrocious crime that cannot be that cannot be the reality. So we need to find African solutions to African problems. Our issue is that we've absorbed this Roman Dutch law and, and, and whatever the, 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 the foreign mm. NATO encyclopedia says, we adopt that as law and part of our language and part of our curricula. If I had time, I'd discuss, moderate about even the themes and the language we use when we talk about <coughs> land, land grabs, mm. you know? Uh, somebody has just, it's a land grab as if you've gone and you've, you've taken it illegally. Yes, there are legal mechanisms but people need to live. Languages such as, you know, enforced or illegal mining. So for, for long minutes, okay, go into that area because you've got the rights given by government. When the miners protest, gun 34 of them down, they are dead. We call it a massacre, uh, 16 uh, August 2012, and Min continues to mine. Mm. But if another African is found, and they say, I found coal or I found mineral, then it's illegal mining. But for a London mining, it's, it's absolutely correct. We need to look at the nuances and languages that we use. Uh, 
in, in trying to advocate African challenges, how people cross borders, what we refer to it, you know, Australia's border control. In the Ukraine, they don't call it uh, strainers border control. They didn't call them foreign nationals. But you know what was interesting? Is that when when you, the, the Ukraine people were leaving because of the war, it was Ukraine is first and Africans last. It means that in their country, they still consider Africans as less people. You know, children of a lesser God. But you come to Africa, we use the same mathematics to define our own people who are two meters away on the other side, and both here and both there. Uh, you know, uh, my, my comrade is talking about Mkize, um, and somebody saying this Mkize is a foreigner. But this Mkize almost became the president's brother if Zueli Mkize had won. If Zueli Mkize had won, you'd have a brother who was a president. You'd live better in, in this country. You know, my banners are related to us. So I think we need to assess our language. And, and a lot of our, our, our literature on the, the references we use because we adopt uh, foreign language, we adopt foreign encyclopedia and foreign mathematics and that becomes a challenge. We, we can't use NATO set laws to define African solutions. We must call for African solutions to African challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. I, I was really moved by the story of Hazel and Mkise. So we now know about the Mkise. Uh, we must <laughs> follow that lineage of the Mkise and uh, the inspiration, especially the words that are used. And I think from time to time, these kinds of sessions don't lead to some kind of deliberate organization. And when I say, the, you know, you, I, we understand where the formation of the, and the constituency of the, uh, the constituting of the, constitutive act of the African Union, the African Union itself, the OAU, it was part of deliberate organization. With the inspiration of understanding uh, in the main a pan-Africanist uh, caliber of those in the continent and those in the diaspora. Um, and what is important for me is when you say our freedom is unique. <coughs> and coming from uh, you know traveling the continent i understand you, you 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 believe the freedom of children as you see them when they dance or when they exercise the fulfillment of themselves is the freedom of the country or of the people or of the future not understanding that that freedom may just go as far as the school yard um uh, boundary walls um, and, and I'm saying this because I, I want to go to the point of uh, the, the second speaker's book about Guhuru Kundi and sanctions. Yes, we want Zimbabwe's sanctions to be uplifted. Whatever form of force, and I remember I was part of a delegation of the ANC Youth League that went to visit and spend time with Mugabe and Zanu PF. And we visited at his residence, and one of the things that we spoke about is the approach of ZANU-PF when it comes to exercising force during elections. And there was a commitment at that point that that would not happen. Because, and I want to stress this, if one can prove to me an uncontested, free and fair and perfect election, it would be the day that I would then uh, not have anything to say. Because every person who's contesting an election is not contesting to lose. They are contesting to win. And they will declare something unfair, incredible, uncredible. The reality goes back to a deliberate reorganization of soldiers, of people, of multiple mindsets and ideas that can come together with one message that says, train us, let us go back and take back power if we have to from dictators. And that is the deliberate reorganization that I'm speaking of. It is not for us to be complaining. It's about what we see happening at the ballot. We saw what happened at the last local government election ballot. 
we can foresee the future of the 2024 national election ballot and we still assume that, oh no, it could not be fair here, it could not be, the projections are out there, we see what happens on the ground. Many of you in the room are analysts and are considered in that area. So when we speak about, I, I, I have, a, um, you know, the dignity of, that is the ultimate uh, utopia, uh, to have that perfect election. Uh, however, just to close, I want to go back to the question or the, the point put for discussion, the state of human rights in Africa. And I must ask myself whether the state of human rights in Africa does not come before the consideration, not only the scramble, the, I'm talking about Berlin, um, the Berlin Conference, the consideration of the fact that one, this continent was going to be mutilated, violated, and uh, desecrated by a whole bunch of Europeans from different parts who had their own, and I must stress this, a barbarianism that they had imported to this continent. In the name, therefore, when we want to strike a deal and talk about diversity, talk about culture, identity, religion, that which separates us is indeed a farce in its very, in its very, it's because they understood a hegemony, like who was it that said uh, 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 um, the Ukrainians came first, it's FISO. Mm -hmm. The hegemony that is understood in Europe is not a hegemony that's understood in Africa. So here, here human rights becomes pertinent as a means to wrap us on the knuckle. You're out of order because you can't accept, tolerate or acknowledge that this right of this person is different to the right of the other. And hence for the purposes of hegemony versus diversity we then accede to acknowledging what we refer to as human rights as opposed to equality, I thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, and those still online, um, I think uh, the organizers here are looking at me time-wise. Um, there has been an expanded uh, panel and really serious issues that uh, we even violated our own um, time and we were unable to manage and finish on time. We're supposed to finish it after four, uh, but nonetheless, this has been rich um, discussions and a number of issues. And I hope the organizers and everyone will take these debates forward and come up with sort of way forward, I mean, certain actionable um, recommendations and, and, and to develop certain policies to resolve the problems that we've discussed. I think it's important that we go beyond just discussing. Let me uh, hand over to the organizers for any information um, uh, before we disperse. But I'd like to thank you. Uh, I hand over to my brother here. Thank you very much, Prof, for the great facilitation and the panel. I think uh, you know who the panel are. I don't have to repeat and go over, but thank you, Magdalene. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Sufiso. Thank you, uh, Brother Sheikh. Uh, we thank you for the ambassador joining us as well. And thank you for each and every one of you taking the time to spend it listening and debating the important issues that have arisen. We're obviously not going to find all the answers or find solutions in one debate like this, and we hope to have more. And we thank those who are online who also took part and we know there were struggles but when the when the clip is put online later as well i think it will be a lot more clearer than any of the initial hurdles that you experienced once again thank you on behalf of the organizers and we look forward to seeing you again